Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Nudge Foundation and a keynote with Desh Desh Pandey, moderated by Amit Varshneya. Uh, quickly, before we start this session, the session is 30 minutes in duration. Uh, the audience will be in listen-only mode, but you can put questions in the Q&A box. If you're not in the Zoom meeting, uh, but watching on a streaming service, you will not be able to ask questions. Uh, to join and engage on your phone, uh, please download the Attendify app and join us there. Uh, to get the session started, I would like to introduce Amit Varshneya. Amit leads the Nudge Foundation's US strategy, fundraising, and partnerships to help build a global base of supporters and he also oversees the Nudge Foundation's outreach and communications team. Thank you for joining us, Amit. Over to you. Thank you, Reema. Um, it's uh, my privilege and honor to uh, welcome uh, you, Desh, to the Nudge Forum. Uh, we've had an amazing uh, conversation so far. Um, we've talked about uh, you know, the challenges in India and also the great work that's being done and being, uh, being done in the future. So I think it's just so apt that we're talking to you because you're such an inspirational figure. Um, to others, you know, to, to let me just refresh your memory. Uh, Desh is an Indian American entrepreneur and uh, philanthropist who co-founded Sycamore Networks, Cascade Communications, and now the Desh Pandey Center for Technological Innovation at MIT. He's a life member of MIT Corporation and holds a BTEC from IIT Madras, an ME from the University of New Brunswick in Canada and PhD from Queen's University in Canada. They co-chaired the National Council to support President Obama's innovation and entrepreneurship strategy from 2010 to 2015. Welcome, Desh. Um, so like I was saying, the, the conversation has been about making change. We had conversations about systems change. We had conversations about well, philanthropy. And um, the way to make systems change, so some of the topics we can talk about were, you know, there's, there's infrastructural and ecosystem level changes, changes that need to happen. And, you know, you've, you've done so much in that area. So I would just want to start maybe at the top and ask um, about your personal journey where it has been, right? Right from in the 1990s with innovation and how as a tech entrepreneur to now a social entrepreneur uh, focused on in enabling innovation in, in the US and in India and, uh, and then just, you know, how you've seen that journey happen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amit. First of all, uh, happy Independence Day. Uh, I very fondly remember celebrating the Independence Day, singing Sare Jahan Se Achcha, Hindu Satan Amara. And uh, it's amazing as we have heard from so many people how far the country has come since 1947. You know, we have heard from uh, policymakers, people who are global thinkers who can uh, look at the whole picture and tell us how we come up with better policies. Asha talked about how do we invest in a way so that we can have an impact. Maybe I can talk a little bit more about what can each person do? What can each one of us do to bring a change to that, uh, uh, the, the life? And my journey is, you know, I, I was an entrepreneur, uh, built a bunch of companies, but for the last 15, 20 years or so, I've been more and more into the foundation. And, and now I would say I'm more or less a foundation junkie and spend most of my time on the uh, social sector. And <clears throat> So, and, and we started this big program in India about 15 years ago. Initially, we started off as a grant making agency. So we made grants to about 183. The idea was to sort of be like a venture capitalist and help these organizations grow. And, and out of the 180 or so, maybe about five, 10 of them really scaled quite a bit, like Akshay Patra, Agustya and so on. Um, and then the others did okay, but some of them, couldn't really get very large. And, and part of the reason we found is that the, in the nonprofit sector, most of the people have enough cash flow for maybe a couple of months. So they're constantly struggling to meet the payroll. 
And, and so when they come up with version 1.0, they have to keep pitching 1.0 really so hard to raise the money that they really can't go from there anywhere. Whereas, you know, in business, you would die if you don't go from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0. And so you need a balance sheet, a good balance sheet to actually be impactful in the, even in the nonprofit sector. And so we thought maybe it's an opportunity for us to change the practice. And so we switched over to being an implementing agency about four years ago. So now we have a, a 300,000 square foot campus, a 100,000 square foot incubator, about 700 people in the payroll. So it's a fairly large infrastructure. Now, maybe I can talk a little bit about what's different about being an entrepreneur versus being a social entrepreneur. You know, and there's so many people, you know, people like yourself, who've been an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and now they're saying, hey, I want to do a lot more. So a good framework is, is to, you know, the world has about 7 billion people and there's about 2 billion people who have disposable income and about 5 billion people don't have disposable income. An entrepreneur is always motivated by making a change in the difference of people, right? So you look at the world and say, it's A, it doesn't have to be A, it can be B. Uh, but the way you make, bring about the change in the people who have disposable income is very different than the way you can do it for the people who don't have disposable income. If people have disposable income, they're Googling for solutions, right? And therefore, when you want to make a difference in their lives, you have to come up with a solution that's innovative, that's something the world has not seen before, either a new technology, a new business process, there has to be something new in there. And, and that's what creates all these Silicon Valley startups and and the businesses, GDP, GNP, everything else. And that's what really has made a lot of progress in the last 50 years in terms of how to take ideas, nurture them and bring them forward. When you go to the other 5 billion people, particularly if you go more and more to the bottom of it, people are just struggling to get through the day. And therefore, innovation does not mean anything. So the equation for the people with disposable income is innovation plus relevance is equal to impact. You need to think of something new. You have to make it directed to some burning problem. It will have an impact. For the other people, it's really relevance plus innovation is equal to impact, meaning you have to co-create the solution with them and build the capacity within those communities to really spread that solution. The new idea that you bring to solve the problem does not have to be earth shattering, does not have to be patentable. Uh, does not need a huge competitive advantage or anything like that. Once you get it going, and if it works in a few places, once you've proven it, then to scale it, you'll probably need all the methodology that you use in the 2 billion people economy to bring to that sector. So, you know, the first 10 years in, in that, we call it the social innovation sandbox in India, was, was pretty much trying to build capability within that area. But slowly over the last three, four years, uh, we've been able to inject a lot of talent from the other sector of the economy. So we have Stanford, MIT, all these guys going up there. We have about 10 IITs working in Hubli. We just hired uh, IAM Calcutta, IAM Ahmedabad guys. So, so now uh, those people can bring their new ideas and also they have to bring with uh, a lot of compassion because you know, ultimately, if you're trying to solve the problem for the customer, you have to understand the customer. And it's very hard to understand the customers for you and me being where we are right now, right? Because we don't understand the risk tolerance, we don't understand what's important for them and so on. So people having all these skills, but really appreciating the fact that we really need to understand these people before we apply a lot of these big ideas is sort of the crux of the issue, I think. And if you did that, things scale quite a bit. And, and, and that's the nice part of it. So uh, that's, that's, you know, I have the Deshpande Foundation and, and the sandbox that you have in Hubli. It's, it's just such a fascinating model, um, having an impact, not just uh, locally, but it's in fact at a, at a, if I would may say a horizontal level in terms of really generating uh, that entrepreneur, that, that drive to build solutions and giving them that, that freedom to build it. Um, 
So I would, you know, I'm sure the audience would love to hear, uh, you know, maybe a, examples of some programs or interventions that you know you, you found really impactful. So we work in four sectors. You know, we work in skilling, where there is millions of people who actually do 15, 17 years of education in India, and they still can't get jobs. So we have a program where in four months, we can whip them into shape and get them a job. And then we are finding ways to scale that. Uh, we work with agriculture. We work with about 120,000 farmers. So maybe I'll, I'll pick the agriculture example to, to demonstrate how, because it's probably our first example, which is ready to scale, it's not scale yet. So any intervention in agriculture, is all about having farmer make more income, right? On an average, the uh, farmer in India makes almost eight times less per acre than what you could do with the most modern technology. Eight is difficult, but you know, if you can get two X or three X, that's pretty good. So we have three interventions in agriculture. One is how do you bring better cultivating methodologies, right? Better seeds, less pesticides, more fertilizers. So we built a network of about 240 of our people who live in villages. Each person works with 500 farmers. And then we have a central group of some research people. So every time there is, so there's always knowledge going back and forth in terms of what should the farmer do and what are the better things to do? And we keep piloting new ideas and so on. So that's improving the, the process of cultivation. The second one is farmer producer organizations where a farmer can get better supply chain and also get better price for the produce because as an individual farmer, it's very hard for any farmer to negotiate with big guys. I mean, this guy makes, he's got no education, there's no, so you, you sort of, so we have a team of people who actually negotiate all the deals and then the FPOs sign MOUs and then they use those contracts. So we don't get in the flow of money, but we cultivate that. But the most exciting program we have is water. Water is the biggest multiplier of income for farmers, particularly in arid land. So this program started about seven years ago when actually Ratan Tata was visiting Hubli for our program. And we said, you know, if you, if you actually dig a hole that's 100 feet by 100 feet by 12 feet, it, it can hold enough water, rainwater, to irrigate about five acres of land and double and triple the income. So he said, yeah, then let's try it. And he actually gave us five machines. So in phase one, we did about 150 of these farm ponds. We didn't charge the farmer anything. We just wanted to learn how to do these and also make sure that the farmer actually makes more money. And that actually proved out to be the right way, right, right thing to do. And then over the last six years in phase two, we've done 6,000 farm ponds, right? And, and a typical farm pond costs about 80,000 rupees. And it takes about 40 hours to complete a farm pond. Out of the 80,000, the farmer actually pays 55,000 rupees and we pay only 25,000. And also, you know, sitting in Boston, how do I know whether the program works or not? I know the program works if there's a demand for it. So for us to do farm pond in any village, 50 to 100 farmers have to get together in the village who have about five acres or more and they have to sign up and then they get a signature of the, uh, the panchayat head and then bring that request to the foundation. And right now we have a backlog of 10,000 of these farm farms. So I know that that program works. So we're just launching a new program now where we're gonna be doing 100,000 farm farms. And the, and the financial model is that the farmer pays upfront 25,000 and then he gets a loan for the other other part of the money and, and he pays it back over the next two, three years. So we're working with the financial institutions to, to make sure that, that financing is uh, arranged, the credit worthiness, new, bring new methodologies of uh, bringing credit measurements to the farmers and so on. So, so I think any anytime you think of the intervention, the intervention can only scale three different ways. Either it becomes a free market intervention and this farm pond is a free market intervention because we have proven it to the point where farmers are willing to pay for the whole thing. 
number two, it can become a part of a government program. So for example, if you look at Akshay Patra, it's a 50% government, 50% charity, or a very broad, a charity. And if it's charity, it should be very broad based. It cannot be one or two people because then it becomes like a business with 10% customers, then you, you'll just collapse. So, and, and, and it turns out that most of the interventions probably will become combinations of all the three the free market, government, and charity. And, and particularly if you go more and more to the bottom of the pyramid, the more you'll have to somehow try to combine all the three. But it's very important to have some free market component if you can have it within the intervention, because number one, it brings dignity. Number two, it brings the feedback. You know, when people pay for something, then you know it's, it's something, you're doing something that they really need as opposed to pushing it uh, down the throat. Got it. And, and this is, uh, you know, sort of resonating so much because at the Nudge Forum, in fact, you know, the idea is essentially, and you look at the, the participation, it's that realization that it's Samad Sarkar Bazaar, which is government, civil society, and markets, and they really have to come together. Um, so, in terms of entrepreneurship, right? If we, if we look at the journey of India, um, in entrepreneurship, I think there's good energy in India now. There, there's um, movement of capital. Um, and so from the market standpoint, yes, there is, uh, you can say there's entrepreneurship that's, that's taking off. Um, but then if you look at the other part, which is the social entrepreneurship part, and just like you said, right? If, if you think of it as a pyramid, there's at the bottom of the pyramid that the needs are different, but also it is understanding that customer base is important. And it is a slightly different supply demand and, and price sensitivity model over there. Um, and so building that entrepreneurial ecosystem for that particular customer base or so has its challenges. And you know, while there are a lot of nonprofits in India, uh, you know, I think it's around 3 million that we have, Akshay Patra being the largest among those, and even half of that funding coming from government. But if you compare it to other, maybe even neighboring countries or countries all over the world, it is still very, very small. And the entire ecosystem is small. So, you know, having done this in leadership with the Desh Padne Foundation as well, what are the factors, would you say, to really jumpstart that, or at least accelerate their, that ecosystem that gets more entrepreneurs in, gives them the, the, the foundation as well as gives them the ability to scale and continue to thrive? So, you know, there is, there is 1.4 billion people in India, out of which about 300 million live in metro cities. And even in metro people, you have a lot of poor people who need those interventions. But the 1.1 billion live in semi-urban and rural. And that's the forgotten market right now. And so, so you, you need to, uh, so the market-based entrepreneurship can address quite a bit of that 1.1 billion people market. And that's what we're doing in our incubator. We've got over hundred companies and, and a lot of them are focused on selling to semi-urban and rural populations. The, the problem with the nonprofit sector is that, you know, what happens in the, so what is the difference between for-profit and non-profit? When you start with the for, you know, both of them are very hard. Both of them start with some entrepreneur having some crazy idea. But in the for-profit world, within a year or two years or maybe three, if you don't converge to a solution, which is for which somebody is willing to pay, you're out of business, you're bankrupt, right? In the nonprofit world, unfortunately, the beneficiary does not pay. Most of the cases, it's somebody else who actually pays the money. So you don't, unfortunately, so you lack the feedback loop, which is a big disadvantage in knowing whether you're doing the right thing or not. And, but also it lets you just survive. So you just limp along. And, and also entrepreneurs, um, just like you in the for-profit. I mean, it's very hard for an entrepreneur to actually give up on what they're working on. You know, conviction and perseverance are their, 
you know, key ingredients and they keep going. But in the nonprofit world, they keep going forever, even if they're not non-performing. Non so like you said, out of the millions of nonprofits in India, there's probably less than 25, which are more than 50 crores a year, right? Even 50 crores is not that big. So, so I think, I think we, we have to somehow find a better efficiency in, in making those assets into performing assets. We actually need a little bit of a, a chapter 11 and modules and acquisitions, you know, all that financial engineering stuff that we, you do in the for profit sector needs to come to that nonprofit sector. But, but people working on the nonprofit, so I think the, so, so there's two groups of people that we are trying to address in this session here. One is people who are actually involved in the social sector and trying to do something. And then the people who are trying to help them from Silicon Valley or, or wherever else or within India. If you're trying to help these people, um, you know, what they have is compassion. And what you have is rigor. And, and so don't lose that rigor for compassion. So the only way we actually bring big difference to the world is if you bring the execution excellence of the for profit to the compassion of the nonprofit and to bring some of the compassion of the nonprofit to the execution excellence of the for profit. So people who go from the non for profit sector should help these people be a lot more rigorous. You know, just like you would have a phase zero, phase one, phase two. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're pivoting, you're, you're experimenting, you're measuring, you're looking at what you're doing. In fact, uh, we would love to promote that process, but first we have to do it ourselves. So we actually have a Tata Deshpande Innovation Center in Hubi, where we, we have about nine interventions and all the nine interventions are going through that process right now. So Farm Pond is probably the one that's the furthest along, uh, but the other ones are coming along. And, and I'm hoping that if we can actually show that that's a good way to invest for a bigger impact, that a lot of the philanthropists and the CSR money and everybody else will start investing in that more as opposed to just doing more of what people are doing. You know, right now, philanthropy would mean you look at an organization which is having a good intervention and you put a lot of money in that intervention and you try to scale it, right? But in addition to scaling it, you always need to put a portion of the money in making it even better so that you can scale even better, right? You just like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10% of the, your, your expenses goes into R&D. We need to create that R&D investment within the nonprofit sector so that your money will go a lot further in the future. So, so we've talked of ecosystems and we've talked of the business models. Um, being in Silicon Valley and talking of India and US, you cannot leave technology behind. Um, and it's, you know, the, it, it is something that has proven to leapfrog a lot of, uh, you know, in systems in terms of, you know, the cell phone revolution in India. But that's sort of the foundational element. Where do you think um, technology innovation? I mean, I think it, it's, it's clear to say technology innovation has a role to play, but I would say, how can technology innovation be really applied to make that impact and leapfrog, especially in the case of social entrepreneurship? Yeah, so it, it's a question of, uh, you know, one is technology will make progress. It'll, it'll become cheaper and cheaper, friendlier and friendlier, easier and easier to use. And as you go from one generation to the next generation, the adaption it will be a lot more. So it, it'll all happen slowly. But the question is, how do you accelerate it so that, you know, people don't have to suffer through that a long period of time. So, so I think it's a, it's a question of coming up with good solutions, but, but also building capacity to be able to absorb it. So let's say, for example, India is building fiber internet in every village, right? So there's going to be enough information flowing through all these villages. But the ability of the farmer to consume that information is very limited. You know, his education is the level where he can consume maybe two, three lines of information at a time. So it's almost like building a ramp. So we have uh, these 200 
and 40 people in the field who are more minimum wage, but that's the, 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 we have trained them. So they're good for maybe two pages, right? So they can read those two pages and translate it to two lines for the farmer. And then we have a central group. And then we actually have a, an engineer in Silicon Valley who, who, who is constantly looking at the satellite imaging, uh, looking at the, uh, you know, the, the land conditions and what's happening and so on. So it's, a, it's, it's building that ramp all the way from uh, the solution to the ability to deploy it in the field. The mistake that a lot of us make, technologists, is that we get all excited about how innovation and technology can actually have a big impact. And we start creating. So every Silicon Valley entrepreneur wants to create this app, which will solve all education problems, right? So, and, and in fact, that's the problem with the nonprofit in the US, because US always thinks that the nonprofit has to come up with a better and better and better product, which can solve the problem. But you can sugarcoat the candy only that much. Just sugarcoating the candy will not get you there. You have to be in the field to inspire people wanting to change. And so it's a little bit of a cultural change, right? You have to show what's possible. And so you have to maybe make it happen with five people and then it'll happen with 20 and then 50 and 500, 5,000. At some point it will become a critical mass and take over. But causing that, that change, the agent of change within the community is what's painstaking. And, and you have to sort of keep doing it and then maybe you'll find a leverage. And, and this is true in US and in India, in US. We have a program called Entrepreneurship for All. We run it in 10 impoverished communities. We're going to do another 300 of these. And we're going to be creating about 9,000 new companies. These are the kind of companies where 75% of them are led by women. 50% of them were previously unemployed. 60% of them are of color. But these impoverished communities, when you go there, there's not much entrepreneurship. So you really have to handhold, handpick and handhold about five of them. And then you do 10 and then you do 50 and then you do 30. So the first town took five years, second one took three. Now we're down to like one. So slowly we're learning how to do it. We have enough examples to inspire those people wanting to do it. So, so you, you, there's some leverage in terms of uh, learning how to do it, but it's very hard to do it without actually being in the field. And, and, and really being there and building the capacity. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the whole perseverance, patience part, and that's sort of common, you know, wherever you go. And, but this, there's that jump starting part. And then the way I think the scale that you're talking about is, is definitely needed. And uh, uh, that's something definitely we all look up to the Desh Foundation for. So I'm just going through the questions, Desh. We have a couple of minutes to go. And thankfully, you know, we've covered uh, most of those questions, I think, um, yeah, we've, I'm just scanning through and we've covered all of them. Um, so I know that, you know, you are, a, you believe in doing rather than talking. In fact, when you agreed to this, it was, it took some persistence because uh, your, your quote was, well, I would rather do rather than talk, but since you guys are persistent, um, I'll say yes. So in the same vein, right, when people, get off this conference and they've taken all this inspiration and listened to all these talks. What is your advice on doing, on, on going forward and making action happen for all the people who are listening either from the development sector or from people who are desirous of coming to the development sector or are entrepreneurs not in the development sector? Yeah, so, so to those who want to get into the development sector, you know, I think, I think some of the old mindset used to be uh, you do well in your professional career, you make a lot of money, and then, and then maybe after you retire, you, you give the money to uh, the development sector. Uh, I don't think that's a good, good way to think about it. I would encourage all the young people to start getting involved in whatever way they can. You know, you decide how much time you want to give, how much money you want to give, and then slowly start getting engaged. And I would, I would stress that slowly. Because what happens is sometimes people get very excited. They, they think that if they just wrote away a big chuck or just gave their life, they can solve world hunger. 
uh, it doesn't happen. You know, it, it's just a, it's, problems are pretty hard. But then, so it's, it's a, so I tell everybody that it's a little bit like playing with fire, the social sector. If you get too anxious and too eager and go stick your hand right inside the fire, you get burnt and then you are bitter and you're useless for yourself and you're useless for everybody else, right? But at the same time, if you never get close to the fire, uh, you'll not experience the warmth. So I would say start early and start inching towards the fire to the extent that you can and, and enjoy the process. You know you're doing it at the right pace. At any given point, if you know that you're enjoying the process, I mean, there will be ups and downs, that's given. But in an overall sense, you don't want to be make it into like I'm sacrificing everything so that I can help somebody else. Um, you really want to be doing it so that you can't believe that you actually get this opportunity to do all these things. So as long as you're enjoying it, I think, I think you're useful to the world. If you're happy, you can make other people happy. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Desh. This has been definitely a pleasure. I've, I've, myself, I've learned a lot and um, I'm sure the audience has appreciated it as well. And we've got all the questions answered. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Amit, and, and wish you all the best with your efforts. <laughs>